I taught in a very rural area with a, a huge amount of, of challenges, both via the school system as well as just the nature of the area that it was in. And I think that has given me a tremendous palette of experiences to better prepare my students now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. The Everything Band podcast is a proud member of the Music Teachers Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on-demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I really appreciate your time and hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help your students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now, on to my next guest, Onsby Rose. Hi, Onsby. Hey, how are you, Mark? Great. So first things first, it is April 1st today, and you announced on Facebook that you just defended your dissertation for your doctorate. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yes, it was uh, a much uh, looked forward to event. I'm glad to have it over with and, and happy to be looking forward into the, the continuance of my career. Awesome. So this is your first official thing as Dr. Rose. Is that true? It is. You were the first person to speak to me outside of my uh, my committee chair as Dr. Rose. All right. I hope your family, too. Absolutely. Yes. My wife. <laughs> I would have to, I, that she, she was number two and only because that I was in the room with Dr. Mickelson first. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, congratulations. That's exciting news. And I, I'm looking forward to hearing what your plans are for the future. Sure. All right, Onsby. So beyond the fact that you just got your doctorate today, can you introduce yourself and tell the listeners a little about a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure, I'd love to. Um, I'll try to make it uh, remotely concise. I uh, I grew up in Virginia. I was actually born in uh, right outside of Detroit, Michigan. I began my uh, Bachelor of Music Education at the University of South Carolina back in the early 90s. Uh, 93 is actually when I started school there. And after about three and a half years of, uh, of studies there, I found that I was, uh, I wouldn't call it burned out, but I, I needed a change in my life, but I, I wanted to continue being a musician. Um, so I had explored and investigated uh, military music options during my high school years. So I auditioned for uh, the Marine Fleet Bands. So just so that we, we specify here, because I have tr such tremendous respect for all of the Marine Bands, I auditioned for at the time what was 12 Fleet Marine Corps Bands that support the Marine Corps throughout the, uh, the nation and abroad, uh, not for the president's own. That's a, a separate audition. Um, luckily, I was accepted uh, past the audition and I Soon after, went to boot camp at uh, Paris Island, South Carolina, spent uh, uh, 16 amazing weeks in the sun and sand, and then uh, uh, rotated out to my bands. I first served in Albany. After the School of Music, I served in Albany, Georgia for about two years, and then I transferred. I had to re-audition, and I transferred to the Commandant's Own, the U.S. Marine Drum and Bugle Corps, where I was a, a baritone bugler with them. I did that for two years, and then upon my re-enlistment, I uh, re-auditioned and returned to the, the fleet band field and spent for a little over four years in New Orleans, Louisiana with Marine Band New Orleans. At that time, at the end of my tour there, I had attained the rank of Staff Sergeant uh, E6, and I applied for a program where the Marine Corps lets me finish my degree, and I went back to school full-time while remaining on active duty. Uh, after finishing my, my music education degree at uh, East Tennessee State University in Johnson City, Tennessee, um, I went back into the fleet as a, a staff member at the Armed Forces School of Music in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, following a couple years on staff there, my wife and I at the time had two children, and we decided that it was time for me to hang up my utilities and go back to civilian life. And uh, I uh, began looking for a job, but I got out of the Marine Corps in October of 2007, uh, not the ideal time of year to find a teaching position. 
So I actually, um, I joke with my students now, I, I tell them I've always been a conductor. Um, only for four and a half years, I was a conductor of a different type. I was actually a freight conductor for the railroad. Um, I continued to pursue musical activities outside of my normal daily work. Uh, I worked for Norfolk Southern and eventually for a while for Canadian Pacific. Um, I continued to play and conduct some, but it was not what was paying the bills at the time. Um, in 2012, uh, an unfortunate circumstance uh, occurred in, in which my, my wife at the time passed away. Um, so I was thrown into uh, being a single father of, of four boys at the time. And uh, at the time, out of necessity, I returned to the classroom. I was, uh, I, I'll never forget a couple days after my wife passed, a friend of mine reached out and said, I hear they're looking for a band director at, at Hampton High School in Hampton, Tennessee. And I said, great, I'm looking for a job that will allow me to be home for my kids because now I'm the only thing they've got. I look back on my public school teaching time as some of uh, some of the best time of my life. I, I, I truly just adored spending time with those kids. I came to that expecting um, my sixth grade class, my beginner class. I was scared to death because I had been dealing with professional musicians for the last 14 years. Um, and I thought, oh my gosh, what you know? What if I don't remember all of my pedagogy from my my uh, music ed degree? And what if I don't know what to tell them? But I found that that ended up being my favorite class of the day. Um, after a few years at Hampton, I decided that I wanted to go back to school for my master's degree. And luckily, I was offered a position as a graduate assistant at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. And I went there for two years, had a wonderful experience. My mentor there, Dr. John Ross, the director of bands at Appalachian, was instrumental in uh, really uh, forcing me to dig deeper into my musicianship and realize what it was that I, I really had to offer. About halfway through that degree, I, I had come to the realization that I really, really enjoyed teaching at the college level and helping uh, teach teachers, teach uh, future band directors, future music educators. So I decided uh, I was turning 40 the second year of my master's and I decided, OK, it's, it's either now or never. So if I'm going to get this DMA, then I need to go ahead and do it. Uh, uh, through God's graces, I was brought to Ohio State. Uh, my mentor here, Dr. Russ Mickelson, has just been incredible. It was initially not even a school that I was looking at, but I came to visit because of a, a friendship that I had one, uh, with one of his current uh, graduate students at that time. I came up and visited for the weekend, and by, by the time I left, I knew that if if offered the position, that this was just this is where I wanted to be because uh, Russ is just an incredible teacher, as well as all of the faculty here at OSU are. Or I, I feel that I'm the utmost prepared to go and teach at the college level now. So then the last three years I've been here doing lots of various different things. Uh, I'm the primary guest conductor of our Wind Symphony. I am the uh, teacher of record and, and conductor of our fourth band, our university band. It's for primarily for non-majors. Um, as well as my composition career has somewhat uh, began. I'm, I'm emerging, I guess you could say, an emerging composer of wind band literature. Has, it's began to uh, advance itself on here. And uh, as of today, I'm, I'm Dr. Rose. And hopefully within the next few weeks, I'll, I'll have a job and, and be able to announce where I'll be going next year. Excellent. Can I ask you a few questions about your time in the Marine Band? Absolutely. So I, I've had several military musicians on the show. I had Sarah Corey, who's the staff arranger for the Army, the Pershing Zone. Uh -huh. I had um, uh, Michael Colburn on, who was a former director of the Marine Band. Um, Marine Band, right. And I've had um, a member, uh, Francis Frankie, a member of the Old Guard, uh, Fife and Drum Corps. Uh -huh. And so you mentioned that you were in the Fleet Band. And so I know most of my listeners may or may not know this, so I figure it's safe to ask. Can you explain I, the difference between the Fleet Band and the Premier Bands and how that that's different when you apply and audition and, and how you're I can. Sure. And I, I will, of course, speak from the Marine Corps perspective because that is what I'm most knowledgeable on. Although I have some knowledge of the other services, I do not want to offer anything that would be inaccurate. As far as the Marine Corps is concerned, um, at the time that I initially entered the Marine Corps, we had 14 musical units. We had 12 what we called fleet bands, fleet Marine Corps bands, meaning that those bands were stationed around the world at various Marine Corps installations. We also had two what we call premier units, one of which was the U.S. Marine Drum and Bugle Corps, the Commandant's Own, which is exactly that, is a drum and bugle corps. Even to this day, they still play two-valve G bugles, um, which you, you can't even find anymore because all the DCI cores now have gone to three-valve B-flats. 
Um, but they're still stationed. They're stationed then and, and currently are stationed at uh, Marine Barracks 8th and I Streets in southeast Washington, D.C. Um, the other, the 14th of those is the president's own, the U.S. Marine Band. Now, there are separate auditions for the premier units than what there are for the fleet Marine Corps uh, units. Now, you can go from the fleet to the premier units, but you have to re-audition and pass their audition. So, uh, when I auditioned to enter the Marine Corps in 1997, I took the audition to be placed to be qualified to be in one of the 12, at that time 12, now there's only 10, uh, one of the, the 12 Marine Corps fleet bands. There were 10 in the continental U.S., one in Hawaii, and one in Japan. Um, that qualified me to be a member of any of those units. If I wanted to be a member of the Commandant's Zone or the President's Zone, I would have to take their specific audition, which is exactly what I did in order to, to move into the Drum and Bugle Corps after I was active duty in the Marine Corps. I had to re-audition for a member of their unit, and then they said, yes, he's musically qualified, and then I had to, to do the paperwork with the Marine Corps in order to transfer there. Um, it's not typical that that happens. It's become more typical in the last 10 years. Um, but most, more often than not, both the President's Zone and the Commandant's Zone pull their members from the civilian sector. Um, the Commandant's Zone, their members go to Marine Corps recruit training at either Paris Island or San Diego. The President's Zone is the only military unit in the U.S. military that does not require their members to attend recruit training. Um, and it's primarily because they, they are not uh, they don't have a combat mission, so the Marine Corps doesn't deem the, ne the necessity of spending the money to train them as a combat trained Marine when there's no opportunity, no chance that they'll ever use those skills being a member of the President's Zone. Is that the only, just quickly, is that the only ensemble in the, in the military that's like that, or are there others in the other services? To my knowledge, that's the only one like that. All of the other premier DC bands and, and all the other services, they still go through recruit training and then upon graduation, they immediately report to their premier band and become their rank is, is E6 at that point. The Marine Band works that way too. You audition and once you get all the clearances and you pass, the only difference is, is you don't go to recruit training. You report immediately to Marine Barracks at Washington, D.C. and the drum major of the Marine Band is the one that's that is in charge of teaching you customs and courtesies and history and when to salute when not to salute all of those type things that you that they would need to know whereas if they went through boot camp then they would learn a lot of the combat things as well that it's just not it doesn't make financial sense to do that because they're not a combat oriented unit yeah it was interesting so let me ask so when i talked to staff sergeant frankie about the old guard he mentioned that the audition had some marching and standing requirements. Was there anything uh -huh. like that with the uh, the the fife and uh, I'm sorry, the bugle drum and bugle corps? With the drum and bugle corps, I did have to send in an initial tape, um, and I had to demonstrate some some uh, basic knowledge of marching technique. Um, however, the Drum and Bugle Corps uses the same marching uh, technique that the, the Marine Corps in general uses, so it wasn't something like I had to learn from uh, from z you know zero level. Um, the majority of it was based on playing, which I did live. They were actually on tour in October of would have been October of 1998. And while they were on the base there in Albany, Georgia, where I was stationed, they had their auditions coordinator, whom is still a great friend of mine, um, Joel Rangel, who has now retired from the Marine Corps. Uh, but he came and listened to me for about an hour. We, uh, the, the audition was fairly extensive. And uh, at the end of it, he congratulated me and they offered me a position with the unit. So let's tie this into the teachers who are listening. Um, if Do you have any tips for uh, teachers who have students who might be thinking about auditioning for one of the military bands? How can they prepare? Yeah, them? absolutely. Um, the first thing is, is practice, practice, practice. Um, it is uh, imperative that you play at the very highest level on your instrument. And more importantly, well, not more importantly, but just as importantly with that is that you are a good sight reader. And by good, I mean great. Um, I can't tell you how many times during my uh, 11 years in the Marine Corps that we went out and played a concert and sight read a march on the concert, L just literally just pulled it out of what we called our pouch, which had uh, anywhere from 150 to 250 pieces in it, most of them marches and played it on the concert without having rehearsed it before or had gone and done a concert and half the literature that we played we only have one, had one or maybe two rehearsals on the operations tempo of 
of the Marine, uh, well, of all the military bands is extremely high. So rehearsal time is at a minimum. So being able to sight read at a very, very high level is of the utmost importance. That was a tremendous part of my audition whenever I auditioned to come into the Marine Corps. Uh, the second with the Marine Corps specifically is that you, you need to have settled on the fact in your mind that you don't just want to be a musician. Um, I know we've all heard and you, you've probably heard from other people that uh, within the Marines in, in any way that we're all Marines first. We're all riflemen first. So when I went to my recruiter's office and said, I want to join the Marine band, I want to be a musician in the Marine Corps. He said, great, we'd love to have you. But do you want to be a Marine? And I, I said, yes, because I did. Um, you are a Marine first. You are a Marine that just happens to play a musical instrument. And that is what your job is. Just like if you worked, uh, say, in the administrative offices, you are a Marine first, but you do your administrative job. That is what you do on a daily basis. So uh, that's of utmost importance for the Marine Corps. I cannot speak for the other services because I've never been in there. I'm sure they each have their own outlook as far as how those things are done. And it's very important that you're obviously willing to be a part of that military uh, mindset. Um, but those are the two biggest things, sight reading and, and, and realizing what the job is. Uh, it's, it's a very rewarding job. Sometimes it is artistically and musically rewarding, and sometimes it's very functional. Um, you might play a march and you might be marching troops, and that's not overly artistic, but it's an incredibly important job. So Onsby, after the Marine Corps and after the railroad and after the tragedy with your wife, um, you, you took this job in Carter County, Tennessee. How long were you there? I was there for two years. And so what was that like to step back into that environment after being away? Um, it was tremendously scary at first. Um, I had wanted to teach high school all of my life. That was really, you know, when I was graduating high school myself, my, uh, my life goal was to be, you know, the best high school band director to walk, <laughs> you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, both concert and marching. I wanted, to, I wanted to be able to do it, be a great, do a great job and to give the excitement and the thrill back to my students that was given to me by uh, numerous of my high school and middle school teachers in my growing up years. So it's something that I had desired to do all of my life. Uh, however, life had taken a couple of twists and turns, as it has a tendency to do, and it took me a little longer to arrive there than what I had planned on. But after everything I had been through, arriving in the classroom, the first I remember the first day it being so incredibly exciting, but yet being so incredibly frightening. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, because as I mentioned before, I, I had been dealing with professional musicians um, between my college years and, and my Marine Corps years, I had been dealing with, with professional level musicians for the majority of my adult life. And now I was in a position to where I needed to teach specifically my middle school classes. They, they didn't even know how to put the horns together yet. They didn't know how to enter the classroom. They didn't know how to, uh, to do anything. So I couldn't use musical terminology because I had to teach that to them. So I really had to go back and re-examine how I thought about things, especially for my beginner class and my seventh and eighth grade band, because I couldn't speak to them in the same way that I was used to talking to people for the last 15 years. That was scary to me, but it was also eye opening because it made me relearn the pedagogy of all of the instruments within the band specifically far better than I ever really knew it before. You know, we all we all laugh and say, uh, your fifth year of college is really your first year of teaching. But I would absolutely agree with that. Although my fifth year of college slash my first year of teaching was a number of years removed apart from each other. Boy, did I ever learn a tremendous amount of things about myself and what I really knew and what I didn't know during that first year. There was many nights that I had to take a clarinet home with me and teach myself to play the stuff that I was about to teach the next day, that way that I could be confident and do it well and, and be well planned for that. Whereas maybe it wouldn't have been quite that, that uh, extensive relearning if I would have started teaching, teaching right out of my degree. So that was scary, but yet was a positive thing. And luckily 
Um, I had a number of mentors on the outside that were, were successful high school and middle school band directors that I could reach out to whenever I had a question and say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing here. Tell me what I need to do in order to do this properly. And uh, so that's, that's, that's one of the advantages that I had. So do you have any teachers going way back in time that you remember as being uh, influential on you? And, and I'm kind of trying to want to get to that moment where you decided you were going to be a professional musician Right. I, I absolutely do. I have uh, two specific folks that were really uh, instrumental in me deciding that this is what I wanted to do for a living. The first was uh, my middle school band director. His name uh, was Claude Griever. He has since passed in the last few years. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky in that I have a lot of mentors. I have a lot of people that have kind of taken me under their wing. But these two men were really uh, the ones that solidified it for me. Mr. Griever was uh, a great person. He was demanding, um, but in a loving way. And I really didn't honestly spend a lot of time in his band because he started me. He's the one who told me, Onsby, you should play trombone. At, at the, the, whenever he did the instrument placement test, I was absolutely convinced that I should be a saxophone player, as every kid, you know, at some point is. And he said, no, you know, according to what I've found when I've tested you on these instruments, I think you would have a, a far better success on trombone. Well, luckily I listened to him, but we moved very quickly after that. And I, I but I started band in another school district and my band director there was very instrumental as well. But Mr. Griever's interaction with me, just his love and his care for me really made an impact on me. And even later on in my in my public school education, luckily we didn't move far away. So he was still very interactive, um, even all the way through college. When I finished my undergraduate at ETSU, he came to my senior recital. Um, and then the next man was my high school band director for my ninth and 10th grade year. His name is Ken Rudd. Um, he uh, lives in North Carolina and has since retired. And uh, he was probably the most demanding person that I've ever come into in my entire life as far as his expectations, the height of his expectations for his students. He absolutely would not accept anything less than excellence. And that made a huge impression upon me. He, uh, he made me realize what hard work is for and what, uh, you know, how that hard work pays off. And there was a moment um, and I, I've told a number of people this before. There was a moment in my 10th grade year for our final spring concert. We were playing this music and our band was pretty good. We were in a relatively rural area there in Abingdon, Virginia, and we weren't supposed to be as good as what we were. Just the, the ingredients of the band program, we weren't supposed to have this high quality. But because of Ken and his drive for excellence, he he gave us the opportunity to rise far above what we typically would have. Um, he had programmed the uh, uh, a transcription of Tchaikovsky's March Slav as the closing piece on our concert for that spring concert. And I will never forget, I was, I was, you know, mid, middle of the trombone section, 10th grader, and we prepared and we worked hard. And it was just one of those moments that when we played the final note and the band stood up, it was at that moment that I knew this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I absolutely adore uh, the making of music. And at that point I said, you know, I want to be able to take my love of this and hopefully pass that on to others. And that's from that point on, there was never a question in my mind that I wanted to be a musician and a music educator. Um, never at, at, at 10th grade, all the way through until we talk right now, I've always known since then that that's, that's just where God has had the place for me in life. So Ansby, in addition to your teaching experience and your uh, doctorate in conducting that you just finished, you're also a composer. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it uh, you know uh, the composition side of my career was absolutely an un unintended and inadvertently entered section. Um, I specifically came here to OSU to study conducting, uh, but I was in the midst of trying to figure out what uh, what I wanted to do my dissertation work on, what I wanted to write about for my my DMA document, 
And uh, I had luckily a few years before become very good friends with David Maslanka. And uh, David and I had actually spoken briefly during my master's degree that, hey, someday when I get a job, I want to I want to commission you. And he said, great, I would love that. You know, David was very interested, especially at that time in writing large works like symphonies. And that's that's what I wanted. I was I played his child's garden of dreams when I was an undergraduate at South Carolina and enjoyed it. My ears weren't quite ready for it yet. They weren't they weren't. Uh, they weren't as advanced as they are now. And then when I came back for my master's degree, my uh, my fellow graduate uh, assistant there at App exposed me. Um, we were just generally talking one day and he said, oh, you should listen to this uh, Symphony Number no. 4 by David Maslanka. So I did. I went home and listened to it and was just floored. So that began my relationship with David. And, and over the, the two years of my master's degree, um, you know, we talked frequently and I told him I wanted to commission him that if if wherever at the point that I talked to him about this, I didn't know where I'd be going to school. But I said, if my mentor will, will agree to it, if, if they'll let me, I'd love to commission a symphony by you as my project and use that as the vehicle for me to uh, research your compositional technique. I'm sure that uh, you, you've talked to David, so you know that his the way he wrote relied heavily on meditation. So um, he said, great, that would be awesome. But there's been lots of people that have written about my techniques from the outside looking in, meaning let's put this into words as to how he does things. He said it would be really great if you'd be willing to, to write about it from the outside or from the inside looking out. And I said, OK, that sounds very interesting. So basically what that meant is not that I, I didn't have to just write down what he does. I had to learn how to do it or at least to a certain extent. So fast forward a bit after this is all approved and the consortium is built in order to commission what was originally going to be Symphony Number no. 11. Um, I started working highly with uh, heavily with David via email and phone. Um, on learning meditation and learning how to access my subconscious. Um, David was a master at that. And slowly but surely, I began to gain some of the techniques. And I'm by no means even now do I have the ability to access my subconscious like David did. But it has definitely continued to evolve. So I got an email uh, this would have been in 2017, uh, the typical email that Jerry Junkin sends out for the call for fanfares for the Dallas Wind Symphony. And at this point, David and I had been concentrating on these, these methods for a few months. And I got this email one evening and I thought, you know what? It's time to take this thing out for a spin. So my wife and I went to bed that evening and I couldn't sleep. I got back up. I remember it was shortly after midnight and I sat down at my, my piano and my computer and I began to meditate, which for me it has ended up being a prayer time. Um, so I began to pray and I began these, these ideas and musical visions began to come to me. And I began to, to be able to somewhat access this subconscious mind that David was speaking of. The, and, and he, he called it active imagining. And uh, I, could, I could see these things, and I, I began to find the melodies that described them musically, and I, I put those down. Well, short, a long story short, over the course of about four hours, I wrote what eventually became Fanfare Die Helden, which means Our Heroes in German. Um, the only reason it's named in German is because my first name is of German origin, so I thought it would be cool for it to have a German name. So uh, I sent that in for the Dallas Winds uh, Fanfare competition and won. Um, I then let some band director friends listen to it. And they said, oh, man, what a great piece. You should you should add woodwinds and expand the percussion and make it for full wind band. I thought, oh, OK, cool. You know, I'll give it a shot. So I did just that over the course of literally about a day. And I sent it to a, a friend of mine whom I trusted uh, by the name of Colonel Jason Fettig at the Marine Band in D.C., fully expecting Jason to email me back and say, hey, nice try on. We keep working. Um, but yet again, another story I will never forget. I was standing in my kitchen one evening and, and I've told Jason this, we've laughed about it. I was, uh, checking my email on my iPhone, like I often do. And I got the email from Jason and it said, Onsby, thanks for sending me this. I've looked at it. What an incredible piece of music. I'd like to program this for our, uh, Capital Steps concert on August 30th and 31st of 2017. Um, and I, I dropped my phone in the floor because I was in such disbelief that the president's own U.S. Marine Band, the colonel, their CO, had just written me and said they wanted to play something I had written. Mm -hmm. 
Never in my life did I think that would happen. My wife kind of looked at me and I was, I was so dumbfounded at that point that I couldn't even speak. And I just picked the phone up and handed it to her and she read it as well. And of course we, you know, went into a massive celebration and uh, of course, I, you know, then the, the piece was performed and that solely, and I've told Jason this, and I, I, I will be indebted to him until the day that I die, had it not been for him taking a risk on playing what was Heroes from the Sea, um, my first piece for Wind Band, I, nobody would know me as far as a composer goes. So he played that. And then things continued, and over the course of time, uh, Larry Lang at the Air Force Band and a number of other people uh, convinced me that I should write, that I should take Heroes from the Sea and turn that into a suite. Uh, Frank T. Kelly actually was the one who recommended, he's like, ah, oh, that would make a great first movement to a suite. I said, okay, let's do that. So we built a consortium and I realized that it wasn't a suite, that it was a symphony, that it was, it was of symphonic proportion, that it needed a fourth movement. Um, each of the movements were for, you know, specific armed services in our, our nation and it, but it, yet it needed a fourth movement to commemorate uh, those that we've lost. And then come to find out that fourth movement of what's now my symphony number one has ended up being the most popular of all four movements. Alex Kaminsky and the Stoneman Douglas High School Band performed it to acclaim at Midwest this past year. Um, Jason Fettig is doing it with the Marine Band at Wolf Trap in May. Um, and it's gotten numerous other performances by consortium members throughout the nation. So that kind of projected me into, uh, uh, you know, being at least emerging as a composer. And then since then, that has produced a pretty consistent a string of commissions. Um, I've got a number of different ones going on right now. The big one that I'm currently working on is uh, a commission that's being led by the Brooklyn Wind Symphony and Jeff Ball. It's for a piece that I'm uh, calling uh, City of Dreams, and it's three movements based, uh, each movement based upon a, a historical quote that has to do with uh, immigration and the, the opening of our, our nation's doors to those from, uh, from around the world. Um, so that, uh, that should be completed later this summer. I just finished a commission for Eastern Arizona College. Um, my mentor here at OSU is also the music director and conductor of the Newark Granville Symphony here in Ohio. Um, and uh, they have commissioned me to write a, a concert opening fanfare for uh, next season um, and just various things like that going on. So things, things are going pretty smoothly. And it's although people have asked me, hey, would you like to just be a composer for a living? Um, and I'm happy to say I want to continue being a composer, but I can't imagine not teaching also. I just I love the classroom. I love being in front of students. I love uh, rehearsing ensembles and doing what I do as a as a band director. But boy, uh, having the composition on the side is a, a really uh, I, I'm thankful that God has given me that in my life. So let's talk about I did have a question that came up while you were talking about David. Uh -huh. And I was thinking back on what you were talking about, about uh, wanting to be involved in teacher education. What skills do you think are most important to teach young teachers who are about to go out into the world? I have my thoughts on this, but I'm interested in yours. Um, in my opinion, it is a, a love of people. Um, the way that I view music and what we do for a living, although I love I love preparing an ensemble and giving an outstanding concert. I love seeing the members of the ensemble when they stand up to, to accept applause at the end being obviously emotional because they know what an amazing product they've just produced. They know the, that they've created a, a piece of art for those that are listening to, to, uh, to hear. But I think the most important part is a true love of people and young people for that matter because if you look at what music educators in 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 the pre-college schooling do so in public school in grades k through 12 um, only a very small percentage of the students that you teach in your high school band or choir or your general music classes or whatever are going to go on to pursue music as a profession and there's nothing wrong with that because there's so many jobs in the world that need to be done. However, the lessons that they learn in that music classroom are many times very different than what they may learn in the other classrooms in the building. And those lessons they carry with them throughout life. Some of that has to do with, with discipline of you know practicing and obtaining a certain level of performance on musical instruments. Some of it comes from just 
watching, you know, part of it is just purely out of the fact that, that we band directors in general spend so much time with their students because of the nature of what we do that they're almost like a secondary parent. And in today's society, there's so many broken families that sometimes many of those students may not have one or two or any parents to look to look to. So they're you, you're you're a surrogate parent in the classroom for them. So I think that my I, my hope is is that my students that leave college and go teach that they realize those things and that they. Uh, they teach accordingly, that they teach with a true love and desire for their students to be successful in life. We're not teaching just to make music majors. We're not teaching in hopes that all of our band members will go off and be band directors themselves. We're teaching so that all of our students will go off and do whatever it is that they do to the absolute best that they can, and they use that in order to make our world a better place. That. That's purely my goal is that the teachers that I help produce are able to do that for their students. Because if we all if we all do that, boy, what a world we we will live in, because everyone will be be dedicated to working together to make the world a, a better place. And that and music is just my avenue for being able to help help with that. All right, Anspi. So um I ask every guest a list of questions that come, become like a common ground for all of my guests. Uh -huh. And the first of these questions that I ask everyone is, where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition in music? Oh, you know, that's, that's tough because I, do, I, I believe that competition is vital in music, especially if you choose to be a performer, be, uh, for example, to perform on an instrument, that's what you want to do to make a living. Um, I think competition is vital because that's the real world. Um, I, I'm, I'm very careful in, for example, with, with undergraduate music performance majors um, in the fact that I want to be very open with them that, well, let's put it this way, uh, a, a professor of mine in Appalachian State, uh, John Beebe, he's the bassoon professor there. He also taught my philosophy of music class during my master's degree. And he uh, had a very profound outlook on this and described it in this way. The year that he applied for the, the, the position as the bassoon professor at App State, there were two positions open for bassoon applied teachers that year, the one he was vacating and the one he was going to. However, there were hundreds of bassoon players looking to fill those positions. The reality of life is, is that there were only going to be one opening because Dr. Beebe took the one at Appalachian, which opened the one from where he departed. So one other person was going to fill that position. The other 99 or 299 or 1,099 bassoonists that were applying for those jobs were not going to get a job that year. So the fact is, is that music is an incredibly uh, competitive field to go into. And I think we need to be completely open with our students and letting them know that. And I think that we need to provide for them an experience at college that is, is embracing and loving and caring, but yet is not coddling to the fact that they uh, receive this um, untrue belief that when they graduate, they've got a job waiting on them. Because in order to have that job, they have to be the best. And if we let them, if we give someone principal chair in our top ensemble when they don't deserve it, then that's giving them that false sense of security. So I believe that that part of the competition is healthy and, and required. However, I do believe that there's a balance there that we can get to a point, and uh, my colleagues and I have discussed this from time to time through the years, that at some music school where the competition gets so... Uh, the battle is fought so hard that it's detrimental to those that are fighting the battle. And I think there, it, it's a very fine balance there. And I'm not sure that I, that I have the answer of how, how to make that balanced evenly. Cause some places uh, I think that we coddle too much and some places the, the sense of competition is so much that we have uh, students that are debating, you know, hurting themselves and different things like that because they didn't get the chair that they wanted or they didn't achieve the grade that they wanted. So I think uh, being 
having a close knowledge of those students and trying to be there as a support structure for them, yet not giving them a false sense of security by allowing them to have something that they haven't earned. I, I, I treat it basically the same way I treat my own children. I have five boys at home ranging in ages from 17 to 7. And I love them dearly. I find myself many times wanting to give them something that they didn't necessarily earn or deserve. And I have to step back and say, no, although this hurts me not to give that to them, I'm only doing them more harm in the long run if I do so. And I think the same thing with my students uh, here, uh, you know, where I'm at currently. And I'll think the same thing of the students as I go on out and and, uh, continue my teaching career that I love them, everyone. I hope that they all know that I love them. I think they do. I think the majority of my students realize how much I care for them. But I care for them so much that I I'm willing to give them what my mom would call tough love. So how do you find work life balance in your career as a musician and music teacher? Oh, boy, it's tough. Um, There are times of year that I absolutely do not have work-life balance because um, the the job requires such a large amount of my time. And then there are times of the year that I make uh, a concerted effort to make sure that I set that aside. Part of what has helped me during my graduate school years is, of course, there's three months in the summer that I don't get paid. So because of that, my wife... uh, is also, she also works. And and luckily for me being a band director, I couldn't have married a better person uh, outside of the fact that I'm I'm madly in love with her, but she's also an an instrument repair tech. So so, um, in the summertime, she works 40 plus hours a week and I stay home with the kids. In the other nine months of the year while I'm working, um, she still works, but she works a reduced schedule so that she's there when the boys get on the bus and she's there when they get home, thus allowing me to pretty much come and go as I need as far as my work goes. So our balance is not so much on a daily basis as it is on an annual basis, I guess you could say, in the fact that I spend a tremendous amount of time with the kids in the summer. But then during the fall and spring, when I'm teaching and have late rehearsals and things, there there are days that go by that I'm unable to see them. But we do try to set aside time at least once or twice a month that Uh, We do something together that we go out and do whatever. We have really done good in the last couple of years that uh, we sit down and have dinner together at least three days a week. And there are no electronic devices allowed at the table. There's no television allowed to be turned on. There's nothing other than the food on our plates and the, the seven of us sitting around the table. And I tell you, that has made a tremendous difference in our lives because I get to hear about what's going on at school. Right. Um, I get to talk to them about, you know, my, my, my two oldest are uh, teenagers now, and they're going through, you know, all the things that come with that, the challenging teenage years. And I get to hear from them. Um, I get to hear how my, my second oldest, he's a clarinet player in seventh grade, and how he's scared to go to solo and ensemble because that he's frightened to play in, fr- in front of people. And I get to hear my my uh, my stepson from my, my current wife's first marriage. I get to hear about you know his interactions with his teachers at school. So that's that's kind of how we've approached that. And then we've got certain activities as a family that we really enjoy doing together. Um, one of those is camping um, and hiking, and we make a real effort. Uh, during the warmest part of the, during the warm part of the year to again put the devices away as best we can and my wife would tell you that we're not always successful with that because I'm I'm always checking email and especially with the job search going on I'm I'm, I'm you know right on top of things trying to make sure that I take advantage of every possibility that's out there but for the most part we do pretty good as far as hey let's go take the camper and let's go for the weekend and let's swim let's hike let's do whatever and just and, and even if it's just all sitting around the living room, just watching a movie together, sometimes that's what family time is, too. Um, so we we just have to actively try to figure out when we can make that work. And I, I think we've done a pretty good job of it. There are times a year that it's really hard, though, especially in the fall with marching band season um, and all the things that come with that. It, it can get very challenging to find time. And I, I can always tell because. When I get to the time where I haven't seen the kids as much as I probably should have, one of the boys will say, Dad, we haven't seen you in X number of days. When are you going to when are we going to see you? Or they'll see me with my uh, my work clothes, my, you know, getting ready to go to school or what have you. And they'll say, oh, you're leaving to go to work again. I haven't seen you in a week or whatever. And that reminds me, yep, I need to find time to spend with these kids because someday I'm going to retire. 
And although I love music and I hope that I can continue to do it the rest of my life, really what's going to be left when I retire is going to be my wife and my kids. And, and you, you've, my wife is good about reminding me that people on their, de- on their deathbed, when they're getting ready to end this life here on earth, they rarely, if ever, would say, man, I wish I'd spent more time at work. Nine times out of ten, what they're going to say is, I wish I'd spent more time with the people that love me and that I love. So I, I have some, some quotes and Bible verses that I keep on my wall here in my office that I read very frequently that, that keeps me, attempts anyway, to keep me centered on what's truly important and, and what the balance of life is supposed to be. So how about... Um... What are the challenges that are facing music education and band as we move forward, and and how can we best meet them? Well, I mean, we, I think we've got the typical ones that people think of in that our education system, our public education system in the United States is constantly evolving. Some way, sometimes, in ways that us as educators don't always agree with. Um, I think that you know we've we've got a, a, a huge focus on the STEM subjects. We're beginning to see the pendulum swing back, I think, a little bit in that, in the fact that we're we're realizing that STEAM is important as well, that having that arts curriculum in the school is incredibly important. Um, I I think that we have to be very careful about that. Just as we were discussing earlier, music is a a way for, for students to learn, to not only appreciate art, but to be able to emote in a different way. And I think that the, the students, if it's taken away from them. And that doesn't mean they have to participate in band their whole high school career or what have you. But if they're not given art in their curriculum pretty thoroughly throughout their public education years, then they don't grow into a well-balanced person. So I think that's the first challenge that we're seeing is trying to make sure that we advocate for music education in our, in our public school systems throughout the nation in order to make sure that that's still an option for our students to participate in, to continue to make them well-rounded people. Um, the next challenge is just uh, the, the, the finances and the time. Uh, you know, as, as our economy continues to evolve, we, you know, we're now in a time when I was growing up, my most youngest years, you could still make it, a family could still make it with only one person working. Nowadays, it's very difficult for us to make, for, for people to financially make it and live a relatively comfortable lifestyle without both the mother and father or two people in the home working. What that does is it creates, uh, it, it takes away the ability of being able to uh, be there for the educational experiences. My wife and I struggle with this all the time because she's the one who primarily deals with the IEPs and the different things the boys have going on at school, but yet she works as well. So I think educationally as a whole, we've got that to struggle with. We don't have one parent. It doesn't have to be a mom. It doesn't have to be a dad. It can be either one, but we don't have one parent at home that is there and is totally dedicated to their children's education because they can't be. They have to make a living as well. Um, so I think that's a challenge that we come on. And because of the, of the financial situations, it's becoming harder and harder for students to be able to afford to be in things like band. Um, my first trombone cost $300. Um, And that was a challenge for my parents to come up with that money. And I think it's becoming more and more challenging. I found when I was teaching public school, although I taught in a, I don't think it's a a good representative of a a cross section of America, but I I taught in a fairly rural area. And uh, the second year I was there, my beginner class, if I remember correctly, had 40 students in it. 39 of them played school instruments. And I had to beg, borrow, and steal in order to have that many school instruments. I only had one student whose family could afford to rent or purchase an instrument for them. So that's a – I fought that daily. I went to recruit at the end of the year for the upcoming year. Much of what I heard was little Johnny would love to be in band, and we would love for him to do that, but we just can't afford it. So that's a huge – that's a huge challenge. As far as college level – um, you know, most uh, most colleges and universities have some semblance of a music department nowadays. And we know from uh, the predicted graduation rates of high schools, high schoolers in the next you know five to 10 years that we're going to have a drop in the amount of students graduating purely because that people aren't having 
as large of a family anymore. Um, most people aren't like me. They don't have five kids. Most people have one or two at the most. And because of that, uh, recruiting for college level music programs is going to become more and more difficult because there's going to be the same amount of schools vying for fewer people. So that's a challenge at the college level of, of recruiting and finding people to come to uh, come to your school. So those are those are probably the biggest problems that I see. I mean, we've got a lot of advantages, those too. We've got a lot of great people writing great music for uh, uh, educational, uh, the educational realm right now in both band and orchestra and all the different uh, areas in which you study music in the public schools. So I think there's a lot of good going on, too, as well as we're continuing to, to research and find better ways of teaching our students so that they can be better. I, I hesitate to use this as an example because I think everybody does. But I think if we look to Texas for the way in which they support music education. We have some incredible schools down there with kids coming out of them that are just incredibly intelligent. And all of them participated in band and choir throughout their high school, middle school and high school years. I think it only goes to help make them uh, better at what they do in the future. If you had a time machine and you can go back and talk to your 18 year old self at your high school graduation, what advice would you give yourself? I think I would probably go back and tell myself not to take life so seriously. Um, I think it's important, obviously, to, to work hard and uh, to try to do the best you can and try to be as successful as possible. But I know up until the last five years or so, uh, when I would go towards something, if I would, if I would fail at it or I would not uh, get to the level at which I thought I should, it was really tough for me. Um, it really created a, a lot of low points in my life because I felt um, I felt like I wasn't, you know, good enough. Um, I have since realized in my older years, now that I'm almost forty four, that um, I need to I need to step back and and not take things so seriously. That as long as I'm working as hard as I can, and I'm doing everything that I can in my power to continue to improve and learn and do the best job at what I do then I'm successful. In order to be successful, there has to be some failures along the way. And I think that that's part of a struggle of our society is that right now, um, uh, I know my kids, I see it in them, that they, they are not understanding or accepting of failure. And I don't mean accepting in a nature that it's okay to fail, but what it is okay is to when you do fail, for you to step back and learn from that. And that's something that I didn't I didn't do very well when I was young. If I failed, I thought that I just thought I was a failure and there was no hope for me. And luckily, I continued to get back up and try again. But some some don't do that. And I, I would just, yeah, I'd go back and tell myself, you know what, work hard and do everything you can and learn from every situation, positive and negative. All right. If you had a choice, what would be the final work of music that you'd conduct or engage with? <laughs> oh, oh, wow. That's so hard. Um, I mean, if I had to choose right now, if somebody walked in my office and said, your career is over, you can only conduct one more piece of music and then you will never be allowed to stand in front of an ensemble again, I would probably say pass out the parts to, uh, to David Maslanka's Fourth Symphony because that's the one I'm going out on. That's one of the more common answers. Yeah, I figured it was. I mean, that that piece is just so incredibly powerful. All right, Onsby. So we're recording this on the 1st of April, and I'm going to release this on the 15th of April in just about two weeks. Okay. And so is there anything coming up that you'd like to share or promote? Oh, sure. Um, I've got a couple of things coming up. I'm, uh, I'm headed to Kansas State University here in a uh, little less than two. Well, actually, at the end of the month, I'm sorry. I'll head down and Frank Trace has invited me to come down and join uh, the Kansas State bands. I'm going to be conducting my first symphony with the top group there. And I'll also be conducting uh, a piece that I wrote a few months ago called Scenes from the Blue Ridge that was commissioned by uh, the Washington County, Virginia, all county band. Um, I did their clinic back uh, in February or I'm sorry, in January, and they commissioned me to write that piece. I'm also going to be conducting that, I think, with the second the second band, the symphonic band at Kansas State. Um, in addition, I'm also heading out to Arizona here in the second week of April to join 
uh, the Eastern Arizona College Band and, and serve as a on a residency with them for about four days. They're doing my new piece called Chant Songs and Celebration, which they wrote. Uh, it was a single commissioner commission where they uh, had a young lady in the band that uh, uh, unfortunately was in a car accident uh, about six months ago and lost her life. And they commissioned me to write this in remembrance of her. So I'll go out and work with them on that. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to be there for the concert, but I'll get to spend uh three or four days with them working on that. And then uh, outside of that, really the, the massively important thing that will happen in my life very shortly is on May 5th, I will uh, uh, receive my uh, doctorate of musical arts officially, my diploma from the Ohio State University here in Columbus. And hopefully within the next couple of weeks, I'll be able to make an announcement as to where, uh, where my career will lead me for, the, for this upcoming academic year. All right, Onsby, how can people get in touch with you? Um, the easiest way is via email at onsby.rose at gmail.com. It's, that's O-N-S-B as in boy, Y dot R-O-S-E at gmail.com. They can also go to my website at www.onsbyrose.com. And there's a, a section there where they can send a contact form in. And uh, those are probably the two easiest ways. And I do want to make it very apparent that if, if, if they email me, I will get back with them. That was one of the things that I promised David uh, just before he passed was that the kindness that he showed me that I would absolutely do everything in my power to continue to, to uh, pay that forward in, in being that kind and welcoming to everyone else. So I, I love hearing from people. I love trying to, to, meet, to meet and make those relationships. Um, human, human relationships are of the utmost importance to me, and I truly do cherish those that would like to reach out to me, whether it be about conducting, composing, or just to say, hey, I just heard a performance of your music and I really liked it, or whatever it might be. Um, that's, that's the best way to reach me. Excellent. Ansby, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you for having me. This has been a blast. 